As Illinois approaches its bicentennial celebration, the Illinois Channel takes a look at the people, events, and landmarks that make up Illinois' rich history. Next, from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, a panel discussion on the historic 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. We hear from four witnesses to the convention as they recount the events, the issues, the personalities, and the violent protests which erupted between police and anti-Vietnam War demonstrators. This runs about one hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to make my introductions pretty quick. I was not there, so you don't need to hear from me. I was one of those people who was sitting at home, uh, a young high school student, as the whole world was watching what was going on in Chicago that year. And I'm going to do the introductions here in the order I've asked the, the four of you to talk. So we start with Bernard Seraki. I've always known you as Bernie. Um, completed a three-year hitch in the United States Army in 1966. Most of that, or some of that time was in Korea and what, one month in Vietnam before you came back home and enrolled in Roosevelt University well, at night while he was also working full-time in the daytime. If you know anything about Chicago, Roosevelt University is across the street from Grant Park. So there you are in Grant Park trying to get to classes, I suspect, and there's an interesting scene outside at the time. Uh, Bernie spent uh, 43 years, or over 40 years, I should say, as a lobbyist in the Illinois legislature, so he knows the Illinois legislature very well. Follow that, he has been teaching as a professor at a couple institutions, public administration classes, and oftentimes to foreign students. And in 2016, he published this book, which is the definitive book, many of you are familiar with it, A Just Cause about the Bulgarian impeachment trial. So next we have Richard Dick Simpson, who is a professor of political science at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and you told me, how many years again? 51. 51 years. Yeah. So that's before this happened even. Yes. Uh, served from 1971 to 1979 as an alderman, and if I, am I correct to say the 43rd ward? 44th. 44th. Ed and I take all these ward numbers seriously. No one else does. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in 68, you were the Illinois state chairman, campaign chairman, for Eugene McCarthy. Yes. Who, uh, as far as Illinois was concerned, I believe only had four delegates there, and you were not one of them. No, I wasn't. So you were on the outside watching, but uh, certainly had more than a vested interest in what was going on. And part of that story is in your book, The Good Fight, Life Lessons from a Chicago Progressive, and another book we would certainly recommend you to take a look at. Next is Alderman Ed Burke. Only 50 years as an Alderman, or 49 now, working on the 50th. Um, Chicago Alderman from the 14th Ward. Correct. Since 1969, chairs the Council's uh, Committee on Finance, uh, something of a historian yourself, and of interest to this group, this audience, inside the Wigwam, Chicago Presidential Conventions, 1816, 1860 to 1996. And I believe you said one of the reasons you wrote the book is because most people only know about that convention in 68. Correct. So, and what were you doing in, during the convention? You were a police officer, a young police officer, on the convention floor watching the, the craziness in the convention itself? Yes, sir. And then finally, Taylor Pensano, who is an old friend of many of us here, the author of several biographies on Illinois politicians, including ones on uh, Richard Ogilvie, on Dan Walker, on uh, Senator uh, Russell Arrington, and then you got into uh, Southern Illinois gangsters, mm -hmm. and has written plenty <laughs> on that subject as well. But at the time, you were a young journalist working for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, and I know Taylor has stories about what happened both inside and outside the convention center and right in the midst of it as a reporter, trying to pretend that, uh, well, figuring out, okay, do I want to get beat up by the, the students and the protesters or take my chances with the police at the time? <laughs> right. So after that, 26 years, uh, 
ended your time as a, as a journalist in 78, and then 26 years working for the Illinois Coal Association as a lobbyist, and then you went to your career as an author on Illinois polit political history. So that's more than an introduction I think we need. I've asked each one of them to uh, talk about their experiences, and then we'll get to some general questions from myself, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for your questions. So Bernie, you get to start us off. I, thank you, Mark. Uh, I think what I'd like to do is just maybe talk and set the scene a little bit. Uh, and I, the more I thought about this topic, the more I thought this is a great course to teach uh, at the university. Uh, I'll give you a little background on, on 1967 and 1968 and leading up to this. 1967, there were an awful lot of, uh, of civil rights disturbances in the United States. Uh, and in 1968, two major events happened. Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated in April, which kicked off riots throughout the country in ma many ma major cities, especially Chicago. Uh, in Chicago, uh, 20 blocks were burned, literally burned. It was the biggest fire since the Chicago fire. Uh, in Chicago, nine blacks were killed. Uh, and there was a lot of tension, and uh, the National Guard was called up. Uh, it was a traumatic event for the people of Chicago. In June of 1968, Robert Kennedy was assassinated in San Francisco, or Los Angeles, and, uh, and that was a, was a shock throughout the country. Uh, what had been brewing, and this is something that, uh, that frankly I'm still thinking about, is uh, uh, what had been brewing in the country was this tremendous resentment uh, that seemed to just explode with these two events. Uh, the protest movements were everything from housewives against the war in Vietnam to, uh, to uh, the radical yippies. Uh, also going on at this time was Vietnam. And people were very, very upset with Vietnam. I, uh, I'll, I'll give you, and I must, I'm going to uh, be extremely honest and kind of tell you, uh, uh, give you uh, my situation at the time. Uh, I joined the Army when I was 17 years old, and I wound up uh, spending just about a year in East Asia, in Korea, and uh, they told me when it was about time to come home that uh, I was taking a little tour, and I was going to Vietnam, and I said, but I only have a month left, what am I going to Vietnam for? That's the Army. Uh, they said, you're going to Vietnam. So I went to Vietnam, I was there only a short while. Uh, came back, had a few months to go in the service, uh, was discharged, uh, had met some wonderful people in the Army, and uh, decided that I was going to go to college. I wanted to go to college so bad. It was my dream. And, uh, and, but I still had to work, so I got a job full-time working during the day, uh, by the time 1968 rolled around. And I was working at, and going to school at night. And I carried a full load at night. So this is, and to me, it was a chance of a lifetime. This country was great. This was, uh, I recommend a book that just came out called The Gifted Generation. They're talking about us and the opportunities that we had in the, in the 60s. And I really felt that very strongly. So the whole idea of SDS. In fact, in fact, I make a short story, Mark, uh, and I've told this to Mark before. One of the things that I recall still to this day was the first semester at college. I walked up to an SDS booth. So they used to have these booths where they gave out literature. And this young lady said, I told her that I had just gotten back from Vietnam. This was an anti-Vietnam. And she said, how many babies did you kill? And that just hit me like, uh, I, I can't describe, I can still remember it. Uh, and I thought, you stupid people, you know, this is not, we don't kill babies. And, and so there was this, so that, that's kind of the perspective I, I, I bring to this discussion tonight. And I will also admit that I am not only from Chicago, uh, I am of Chicago. 
So I grew up in the neighborhoods. And uh, so I have that, that uh, feeling towards the city very much. Um, what was going on was all this protest and all these activities throughout the country, not only the, the Kennedy and the, uh, and the King assassination, but the, the riots in New York with SDS and the riots at the uh, at Grand Central Station in New York and the, the taking over of Columbia University. Uh, and this was just going and going. Chicago was chosen to be the location of the 1968 convention, I believe in October. And by November, in December, uh, these radical groups were originally, were already thinking what they would do. Uh, they had, if you recall at that time, uh, uh, the underground press, we didn't have Facebook and, and Twitter and things like that, but they had these underground press and their underground publications. And the language that would come out in these publications was simply atrocious. Uh, and what they were going to do, and we're going to go to Chicago, and we're going to F in the weeds, and we're going to do this, and bring, we're going to, uh, we'll go there and just get high and do LSD and, and tear the whole system down. And there was this movement to do this, tear the system down. There was no ide ideological event or uh, direction at all by these people. There was simply total anarchism. anarchism. And uh, so this is what I was faced. I was faced with. I was a young student. I faced some of it at the universities, but I didn't, uh, I, I certainly didn't adhere to it at all. Um, I think when you talk about the convention, you have to talk about it in two ways. You have to talk about what went on outside the convention and the activities of the uh, of the protest groups and there were many protest groups I have I was going to read them to you but it, frankly it, it takes too long uh, the Walker report which was a report that Dan Walker and his associates gave out and Taylor can tell us about that later on uh, mentions 24 different groups identifiable groups that were in Chicago these groups were being monitored by the FBI being monitored by the CIA, being monitored by the Chicago police, being monitored by the state police. So this was not just, people were, the authorities were not simply blindsided by this. These, they knew that these groups were coming to Chicago and that they were, their intent on just disrupting the city and that's what they wished to do. They didn't wish to elect a candidate. Now, so, there were the McCarthy uh, supporters and Dick can tell us about that that certainly were there, and, the, and Vietnam was the major point. The anti-war groups were major in the political convention. But outside the political convention, these people were just, it was absolute lunacy that was going on. In the convention, met, uh, the, uh, uh, Sam mentioned that uh, uh, um, Hubert Humphrey was, was a, a, a candidate. March 31st of 1968, Lyndon Johnson, and I bet we all remember that, announced that I shall not be and will not accept the uh, nomination to be your president. But you know, that still was, he was still a viable person going into the convention. So it wasn't strictly that he wouldn't, that he could have been, in fact it was uh, John Connors, and uh, Con, Con, help me out that is uh, the governor of Texas, um, John Conley. 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 I'm sorry. Uh, really had ideas that they were going to throw his name uh, throw his name up, and the convention would go crazy and nominate again Lyndon Johnson. All this is going on. The war in Vietnam is going on. The war in Vietnam is not doing very well. That January in Vietnam, the Viet Cong launched something called the Tet Offensive. And though eventually we were able to stop the Tet Offensive, we meaning South Vietnam and the United States, but it was a terrible toll and it was a surprise that it even could, could take place. And I think most people in, the, in, in, in authority at that time realized that we're not gonna win this thing, we gotta get the hell out of here, but how do we do it? There were two planks in the convention the, uh, dealing with the war. One was I, what I, I call the peace with honor plank. And I'll wrap this up because I told Mark uh, 
I would do this in about 10 minutes. Uh, and I probably have run over that time already. Uh, and the other was simply a more quick withdrawal. Um, what happened was um, the, uh, the convention, in, in the convention that they were able to uh, pass the, uh, the Peace with Honor Convention, what I call the Peace with Honor uh, Resolution, and, and, it, and the d demonstrators just erupted. Real quick, uh, the protests and what we saw and what you saw in the, uh, and I want to make this point very strongly here. Uh, Protests lasted probably from about the Saturday before, though there were, there were demonstrators in the city before that. From the Saturday before uh, until Wednesday night was really the big, the big night of protest. What, the, what you didn't see in that clip was the humiliation that was poured out in, in, in the, uh, the, the, the treatment of the police officers before that happened. The demonstrators, and, and as I said, there were 24 identifiable groups. God knows, I mean, you could have, you, everybody in the world was protesting something. Uh, but what those police officers had to take, they were, had people throwing feces and baggies at them. They had them calling, and I told Mark, and my wife said to me, you can't say that, you can't say that. Uh, the names that the, they were calling these people. Uh, these police officers uh, talking about their daughters and what their daughters are doing while you're here. And talking about their wives and what your wife's doing and throwing cigarettes at them and urinating at them. And these officers had to take this. They had to take this. And frankly, when the, uh, the commander said, clear them out of the park, what you saw was what they were doing. They were clearing them out of the park. It's a very complicated five days, six days to talk about. Each one of these gentlemen has a perspective in that, but that's basically what was going on. My perspective was I was watching this. I happened to be there because Roosevelt University is two blocks from the Hilton Hotel, um, and I was amazed by it all. And, uh, and frankly, I think I'll stop there, Mark, and let Dick go on and talk about it. Okay. Dick, you obviously had a very different perspective. Um, why don't you tell us about that? So the first point I'd make <clears throat> is this wasn't just a single simple protest in the sense of even the war in Vietnam. It wasn't like a march that we've become accustomed to about crime in Chicago as it was today or a specific issue. And you're quite right, there were many different groups. But what was actually happening <clears throat> while there were different issues, is it was a clash of cultures. It was a different point of view on each side, and I'll just characterize it in uh, the, the easiest general terms. Um, the protesters believed in community. The protesters believed in individual freedom. Um, the protesters believed that you should be free to do what you wanted to do and that people would come together and form a good society and so forth. The Mayor Daly's and the people on the other side, we began to characterize, say, under uh, particularly uh, Richard Nixon, were law and order. They wanted to preserve the order. Now, both sides had a legitimate point of view in the sense that, yes, we need freedom, and yes, we need law and order. But that clash, you know, became accelerated to almost the slogans of the 60s like free love, and there wasn't all that much free love going on among the protesters at the events. On the other side was uh, what they saw as authoritarianism, you know, the tyranny in the words of the founding fathers. So this was a sort of irreconcilable conflict. There wasn't an easy way to say, oh, well, we'll just patch this up. We'll have half freedom or half law and order. There was an absolute clash. Well, let me talk just a bit about the McCarthy campaign. I started out, I was a young kid uh, like you, but I had gotten a position teaching at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And this, uh, the first day I was in town, we went to what was called the third party convention. Didn't like the Democrats, didn't like the Republicans. We were for other issues, which I'll make clear in a second. And McCarthy came and spoke, but didn't he didn't get the nomination of the third party. The third party never materialized in this particular case, as it often doesn't 
in American politics. But that was the temper of the time. And so later on, that same fall of 67, the McCarthy campaign started within the Democratic Party for the Democratic Party nomination. And we were meeting at the homes of uh, some lawyers and others on the north side Lincoln Park area of Chicago. And silly me, I walk in and say, you're doing this organizing all wrong. This isn't the right way to do this. Now, I'd been in student politics, but I didn't know anything about adult politics. I'd never seen a campaign of the sort we normally think of, so they made me campaign manager <laughs> of the 9th Congressional District. They said, hey, kids, you seem to be critical. Why don't you take over and do it? And then later I became state campaign manager. But let me tell you, with the McCarthy campaign, unlike some of the protests you're talking about, there was a clear ideology. First was the war in Vietnam. We wanted to end the bloodshed on all sides, leave aside all the arguments about Vietnam, pro and con. We wanted the war ended. And many of us were student age or thereabouts and were in jeopardy of being called up and being sent over like you were. The second was racial segregation. We were still, yes, the 64 Act and the 65 Act had been passed by Congress. We were, particularly in a place like Chicago, we were segregated. We were discriminating against blacks, Latinos, and everybody else of a different color, different uh, uh, point of view. And the Civil Rights Movement was a strong undercurrent. The blacks did not come out to be part of the demonstrations because they had been beaten up by the police before. And they knew this was not a good idea to be marching around in Grant Park saying all these kinds of things. But the whites from all over the country were attracted. And part of what they cared about was racial segregation, not just the war in Vietnam. The third thing uh, that uh, they cared about and the slogan of the time was the imperial presidency. President from the point of view of the protesters, could do anything he wanted. And so could Richard J. Daley in City Hall, but that's, you know, for perhaps on the questions. Um, so that was the sort of, you know, the, the, we were running delegates to be at the convention to elect Eugene McCarthy president. Later, Bobby Kennedy got in, Bobby Kennedy gets assassinated, George McGovern becomes the candidate. So you had people backing Humphrey after LBJ pulled out, you had people backing McCarthy, and you had people uh, originally backing Bobby Kennedy and then Lady McGovern, but Kennedy and McGovern were too late to be in the Illinois primary. So it was McCarthy versus LBJ at the time, and then later Humphrey uh, as things proceeded. So we did our best. We were sort of naive. There are 118 delegates from Illinois going to the convention. Mayor Daley wanted them all pledged to him, not pledged to LBJ, not pledged to Humphrey, but pledged to Daley to do whatever he wanted. We had a tremendous battle on the north side of Chicago where I was in charge. Um, we were running against the president of the Cook County Board, uh, George Dunn, and against another ward committeeman. We got about 20% of the vote. We ended up getting 40% in certain wards, and I'll come back to that story in a second about why that's important. But in the total convention, out of 118 delegates, we had four McCarthy delegates. One of them was Adlai Stevenson, and I'm not really sure we could have credit for electing Adlai Stevenson to the Democratic Convention in 1968, but some of the others were legitimately elected by grassroots McCarthy supporters. We were outgunned. We were losing badly. When I became state campaign manager, my job was to coordinate getting all the delegates in, getting them to the hotel, making sure they could go to the convention. We had a separate headquarters handling the mechanics of the, that, but not running the convention itself. When the demonstrations we were watching on TV, not so much the ones uh, before the convention, but when the convention actually started, my wife and I were watching on TV and saw the, the police and the clash and so we did what anyone would do. We hopped on the L and went down to join the uh, demonstrations. <laughs> However, the National Guard had some other ideas, and they had bayonets and barbed wire and jeeps and lots of people marching around, and so we didn't make it. The next day, I was part of the peaceful demonstration that marched from the Conrad Hilton to the amphitheater where the uh, convention was being held, although we were blocked three or four blocks away, but it was very peaceful that march. It was a long march, lots of people. We didn't change much. The same time all of this is going on, inside the convention is erupting in the same battle. 
The McCarthy delegates and the others are terribly upset about the platform. They're upset that they're going to lose this election. The McGovern people are not going to win. All of the so-called peace delegates are people who in the, had been elected across the country. In places like Wisconsin, they elected most of the delegates were McCarthy delegates. California was mostly originally Kennedy and then later McGovern. And so there were, it was, I'm not quite sure, but something like 60% for LBJ and Humphrey, about 40% or 35 for a combination of McGovern and McCarthy. But a truly contested convention. But a truly, I mean, they had demonstrations inside the hall. When they stood up to sing the battle hymn of the Republic, the McCarthy and McGovern delegates would not sit down. And they protested in the hall. You've all seen, I suppose, the clips of Mayor Daley and uh, Senator Rubikoff and their exchange. This was a heated battle in the hall. This wasn't nice, pleasant, like Ed and I would be across in the city council and perhaps you know, trade uh, jokes or something. This was full armored battle by the delegates. I'm not talking about the folks out in the street. Now, there are several things that happened after the convention. The convention wasn't the end of everything. Uh, one of, in most of the country, the people who had been part of the McCarthy campaign disappeared after the election. But in Chicago, we didn't. On the north side of Chicago, we founded the Independent Precinct Organization and we ended up changing Chicago history permanently. Before we founded the independent precinct organization, not a single independent had ever been elected on the north side of Chicago. We sometimes backed Republicans, and they won moderate Republicans, sometimes some pretty liberal Democrats won, but no one who was free of the regular parties. We elected more than 20 people. Many of them became great uh, major figures in Illinois history, say Don Clark Natch, for example, uh, we go on and on with the, the 20 people we elected, Billy Singer and the city council, a number. Uh, of, we made a big difference in the Constitutional Convention. We would, if we hadn't elected the 13 independent delegates to the convention throughout the state, but particularly in our area, we would not have the best constitution in the nation as of 1970, which we did create with the independent vote, and part of that was coming out of this. So the 68 year in the 68 convention was not a one-time event. It was not one protest. It was a part of a cultural revolution. And we could talk about, you know, how well did it turn out with uh, uh, Richard Nixon, how well did it turn out with Daley keeping control of Chicago, but the battles that then followed and eventually uh, by the time of Harold Washington, many things got developed and, uh, and changed permanently in Chicago. 68 at a bare minimum was a watershed in Chicago in, in national history, and it took place on the streets and in the convention halls of Chicago. Okay, thank you very much. Alderman Burke, I suspect you have a little different perspective on what was going on just by virtue of where you were. Well, I probably could say that it's seldom that Dick and I agree on anything. <laughs> uh, 1968 was a, uh, a momentous year in the history of our nation. Uh, the echo of those events from that time still reverberates in the public conscience. In the annals of world history, it was a year of tragedy and upheaval, a time of protest and crisis, scientific advancement, and despite considerable discord, there existed hope and promise. It was, in essence, a roadmap to the future of America and the world. Fifty years ago, NASA successfully sent astronauts on Apollo 8 around the moon as a prelude to the lunar landing a year later. It was the year of Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia when a popular democratic uprising threatened to loosen communist control and free its citizens from oppression within the Soviet bloc. Dr. Christian Barnard performed the first successful heart transplant. As the other speakers have alluded to, on April 4th, 1968, an assassin's bullet claimed the life of Dr. Martin Luther King at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. His death would not silence or still the advance of the civil rights movement or the powerful legacy he's left to generations. Senator Robert F. Kennedy, a declared candidate for president, 
and America's best hope for achieving a lasting peace in Vietnam was struck down inside the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles on June 5, 1968, after celebrating his victory in the California primary. The Vietnam War, then in its fifth year, bitterly divided the nation, unlike any conflict in America's history, with the exception of the Civil War. Students and anti-war activists gathered in Chicago the last week in August to stage one of the largest protests of the era during that Democratic National Convention at the old amphitheater. Across the U.S., people took to the streets at Columbia University in Miami and Oakland and other cities to protest the war and racial injustice. In Southeast Asia, the Battle of Wei, Khaesan, and the Tet Offensive exposed the vulnerabilities of the continuing military presence in Vietnam and escalated the demands at home for a permanent and lasting peace. The government of North Korea seized the U.S. naval intelligence vessel, the Pueblo, on January 23rd, sparking a diplomatic crisis and further escalating tensions in that part of the world, 15 years after hostilities had ceased along the Korean pen Peninsula. The Pueblo crewmen were imprisoned and held by North Korea until their negotiated release on December 23rd. The impact of the protest movements in the U.S., of course, spelled the end of Lyndon Johnson's presidency. LBJ stunned the nation by announcing his intention to not seek the nomination in a speech to the nation on March 31st. The Beatles cut the White Album. Boeing introduced the first 747 jumbo jet on September 30th. Emergency 911 telephone service began in the U.S. Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce launched the Intel Corporation in Santa Clara, California, marking the earliest stirrings of the information age. McDonald's introduced the Mig Mac. <laughs> Detroit Tigers won the World Series, and the Green Bay Packers captured the second Super Bowl and the first Special Olympics began in Soldier Field on July 20th, 1968, to begin a global movement that literally has changed the world. I know that my colleague is going to talk about uh, the nomination of a pig for President of the United States in Chicago, <laughs> but I was interested in learning what happened to those protesters or the leaders of that protest after the convention uh, ended. And this is what I discovered. Rennie Davis, today is 77 years old and became a lecturer and venture capitalist. He started the Foundation for Humanity. Jerry Rubin died on November 28, 1994. He invested heavily in Apple Computer and became a multi-multi-millionaire and a self-styled yuppie. Yes, he went from being a yippie to being a yuppie. <laughs> Bobby Seale was the co-founder of the Black Panther Party with Huey Newton and is still alive. He's a lecturer and working on documentaries about the Black Panthers and his involvement in the movement. Abby Hoffman died of a drug overdose on April 12, 1989. He wrote several books, including, quote, steal this book, unquote, <laughs> and remained a part of the far left movement until the time of his death. Tom Hayden died on October 23, 2016. You might remember he was married to Jane Fonda. He served in the California State Assembly from 1982 until 1992, and the State Senate of California from 1992 to 2000. He taught various university courses and actively supported Hillary Clinton in 2016. David Dellinger, a radical pacifist and member of the Chicago 7, died May 27, 2004, at the age of 88. He was awarded the Peace Abbey Courage of Conscience Medal on September 26, 1992, and continued 
as an activist until his death. Phil Oakes, protest singer and songwriter, died at age 36 on April 9th, 1976. He committed suicide and suffered from bipolar disorder and alcoholism. Lee Weiner became a member of the sociology faculty at Rutgers University. He's still alive and has worked for the B'nai B'rith Anti-Defamation League. John Freund's chemist and anti-war activist, is still alive. He taught at Goddard College. He and Weiner were the only two acquitted in the Chicago 7 prosecution, and he retired in 2011 from the UCLA School of Public Health. And finally, attorney William Kunstler, radical lawyer and anti-war activist, died on September 4, 1995. He was the director of the ACLU from 1964 to 1972. Defended one of the inmates in the Attica trial in 1974 and 75, and represented several mobsters, including John Gotti and Joseph Bonanno. Interesting where they are today. Thank you for inviting me to join you uh, here at this very, very interesting uh, panel. What a colorful cast of characters that the <laughs> Chicago drew that year. And Taylor, you got to see what was going on in some of the most traumatic moments inside the convention center and outside the convention center. I did, Mark. First of all, I want to say that Alderman Ed is a real gentleman. Before we came out here tonight, we had dinner and I wanted to be the one to tell you, to tell you all about the nomination of a pig for president by the Yippies, the Youth International Party. That was going to be a highlight of my talk. And as Elderman Ed was sitting there, he was relating that he was going to talk about it. <laughs> and, I, and I knew he was going to be on before me, so I, I kind of threw myself uh, on his doorstep for mercy, and I'll be darned. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for not stealing my thunder. <laughs> You're a real gentleman. <laughs> anyway, author Norman Mailer was, was right on target when he labeled the convention the Siege of Chicago. From start to finish, the convention was surreal. Unfortunately, it was very ugly surrealism. I and the whole world got to watch a great American city the fabric of it being torn apart at the seams by a violent, violent protest movement. The upshot was, and I was a political writer, the upshot was that the convention, I think, did more than anything to usher into the White House Richard Nixon. Before the convention, I think that Vice President Hubert Humphrey was maybe slightly favored to uh, defeat Nixon in the 1968 presidential race. But after that convention, in my opinion, Humphrey had an insurmountable monkey on his back. Uh, he didn't have much of a chance. And therefore, I repeat that I think that the Nixon campaign got a really big, big break by that convention and that it provided a, a, a wide open door to Nixon to, to become president. Now, I was there as the Illinois political writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. I was 27 years old. I was part of the Post-Dispatch scene uh, team on the scene. Uh, there was also the Missouri political writer. There was a feature writer, and there were several uh, reporters from the, uh, from the Washington Bureau. For me, as a reporter, the convention was both a positive upbeat and a nightmare. Now, on the positive nightbeat part of it, upbeat part of it. My main responsibility was covering Mayor Richard J. Daley and the Illinois delegation. And I think you can figure it out for yourself. I had the best go of it among the Post-Dispatch team. I, um, uh, uh, every day, uh, Daley, who became the most focalized, the most important figure in the convention, was the center of attention along with the riots and covering daily, writing about, da writing about daily was my baby. 
And I actually think that, uh, especially the Washington Bureau guys, were actually a little bit jealous that I was getting a better play on the front page of the Post every morning than, than they were with their stories of Hubert Humphrey, Senator McCarthy, and, and so on. Now, I said that uh, it was also a nightmare for me. And, and you, you know, reporters are supposed to be uh, objective and, and uh, uh, neutral and, and, and all of that stuff. And of course, there's a lot of truth to it. But you know, we have personal feelings, and that includes me. And it was a nightmare for me, and, and it was very frustra frustrating to watch the disintegration of Chicago politically as, as we knew it. Mayor Daley had intended this convention to be uh, a showcase, a showcase of his uh, long and successful political domain. He wanted the convention to be the apex of his political career, uh, a career that uh, uh, left him or certainly uh, embodied him as the perhaps last of the big city political bosses. And of course, what happened is the convention was in, you know, was in shambles. And Daley, uh, uh, his, his dreams of, uh, of a democratic convention that, that, that would show a great spotlight on Chicago and Illinois, uh, you know, went down the drain. And personally, inside, although I was supposed to be objective, that hurt. It hurt me because uh, in circulating with all these other media folks, I just knew that we were going to have a real big black eye in Chicago. And I just, that just didn't sit well with me. I couldn't portray that in my stories, of course, but that was my personal feeling about it. Now, I went to Chicago several days early to write some mood pieces on, on the uh, political atmosphere uh, going into the convention. Uh, I had a room at the uh, Old Sherman House Hotel. You remember that, Ed? And uh, I always stayed at the Sherman House because off of the lobby of the Sherman House was the Selty Cafe. And in the Selty Cafe, uh, a lot of Chicago Democrats hung out there with regularity. And it was really great to go down and just circulate among them and, and, and question them about the, the feel of things and so on. And so that's why I stayed there. And, and, and it was from there that I wrote my two uh, uh, political analysis pieces before the convention started. Now, before I went to Chicago, I made arrangements. I had sources uh, in, in downstate Illinois cities of, of, of mainly young men and women who were going to be among the protesters. They were going to Chicago. These individuals were intent on peaceful protest. They had no intention of, of, of being part of this ardor or, or ending up caught up in a riot or anything. And I want to point out at this point that most of the protesters, the majority of the protesters, intended to be peaceful protesters. And these individuals that I knew were certainly among them. Now, they did tell me ahead of time, though. They said, well, number one, I had arranged that, that, that I would meet with them every afternoon on the edge of Grant Park because I, before I went to the amphitheater at night because uh, I wanted to get local names of some protesters in my stories along with my political coverage and so on. And so uh, they would give me quotes as to the mood of some of the protesters and things like that. Now, um, they, had they had said, though, that I should stay in tune early up there because they had heard that some stuff was going to erupt early. And what happened was, and this is where uh, I thank Ed for letting me relate this, the first thing was that the International Youth Party that we know as knew as yippies, were going to nominate for president a pig. And they did so at an, at an event staged on the, at the Chicago Civic Center, later the Daly Plaza, right by the Picasso sculpture. They brought in a 145-pound pig named Pegasus, <laughs> brought him right on in in a station wagon, as I recall, nominated him for president right there. And immediately they demanded that he be given Secret Service protection. <laughs> <laughs> and they immediately demanded that Pegasus be included from that point on in all foreign policy briefings at the White House. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, obviously it got, a, it got out of hand pretty quick. And um, uh, Chicago police, of course, were on hand, as they should have. And they pretty 
pretty soon cleared out the site. They arrested Jerry, um, Jerry Rubin, who was the, more or less the leader of the, uh, of the Yippies, and six or seven others, and they also arrested the pig. <laughs> True. I watched him put the pig in a police paddy wagon. <laughs> right. Did they handcuff so, it? <laughs> uh, no, Dick, they did not handcuff the pig. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, so, anyway, Reuben and the others, uh, I guess, were found guilty of disorderly conduct, and they paid, I don't know, a $25 fine or posted a $25 bond to get out of, uh, to, to, to get it, you know, back out on the street. Now, for the record, I want to I want to make it clear the pig in court <laughs> and people always ask what happened to the pig well the best I could determine is that the pig was turned over to uh, uh, some facility in in Chicago operated by uh, an anti-cruelty organization uh, as Jerry Rubin was being arrested I asked him where do we go here from from now where do we go from here now Jerry with the pig and his answer was if we can't have the pig in the White House we're going to have the pig for breakfast. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so this was a sign of what was, what, what was to come. Uh, however, this was the only possibly mildly amusing aspect of it. Very soon, the, um, uh, the Yippies and the, uh, uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, uh, Maoists, anarchists, and left-wing radicals of every other stripe we're beginning to implement their plan to disrupt the Democratic Convention, to create disorder, and to do such in a way that would eventually lead to, sooner or later, violence, which of course it did. They operated under a strategy, and they had a name for it. They were, the instigators were very well organized. These folks were pros. They had done this in other parts of the country. And they knew exactly what they were doing. They were skilled in what they were doing. They had a strategy that they called calculated provocation. And calculated provocation <coughs> meant to provoke the authorities and to, to do anything to pr promote th the possibility, the likelihood of things getting out of hand. And they really succeeded. And I think one of the others here has already mentioned that uh, I watched as the pr provocation included uh, the constant calling of police pigs, the, the, the floating of Viet Cong, Viet Cong flags, you know, all over the place. Uh, and then eventually, when some of that didn't work, then they started throwing bottles and cans and tins and pieces of concrete, clumps of dirt, anything else they could get their hands on at the, at the police and at some of the National Guardsmen. It was, it was pretty, pretty sickening to watch, and I got to watch some of it uh, because, as I said, I had to be in the amphitheater at night for writing my straight political stories. But it was interesting uh, as it got out of hand, and um, uh, my observations are, 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 are as follows. And um, I know that uh, uh, Ed said at dinner that the Chicago police had undergone training uh, in anticipation of what might happen. Um, my view is the reaction of the, of the National Guard and of Chicago police um, significantly differed. The National Guard, the Illinois Army National Guard, which, which was on the scene in increasing numbers as the hours progressed, uh, was commanded by a very astute individual that we can all be proud of. He was then Brigadier General Richard Dunn. He was the commander of the Guard's Emergency Operations Headquarters. And as such, he was the man in command on the scene in Chicago. He had personally overseen training of the Guardsmen, uh, adopting uh, uh, tactics, and, and an attitude and a discipline that would, uh, that would really possibly defer the riders or, or, or greatly discourage their, their, um, their, their progress. He, um, um, 
His people, and, and let me say, many of the National Guardsmen were just kids, like the protesters. A lot of them were only 19, 20, 21 years old. But they performed admirably, in, in my opinion. Uh, they were very, it, it, they, they were very, very, uh, as I said, disciplined in resisting all of the all of the taunts and the insults and the missiles of all stripes being thrown at them. I saw very few instances of National Guardsmen uh, breaking breaking their composure uh, or whatever. Uh, they were very successful in using the 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 stocks of their rifles gas and barbed wire covered jeeps in exercising their control as much as they could of the riders and they were and they were successful in fact after a while a lot of the protesters gave up on trying to taunt the guardsmen what they did is they sent some of the young gals up to the guardsmen with flowers in their hands and they would give the guardsmen a peace sign and, and that would be it now, on the other hand, and Ed, you may not agree with this, on the other hand, the Chicago police only took the taunting and the insults so long, and their patience ran out. And then it was my impression that they felt they had a green light from Mayor Daley, or Mayor Daley's office, to react swiftly and forcibly to try to suppress disruption of the convention. And when the dam of their resistance finally broke, they rushed in on Michigan Avenue, on streets and byways around the Conrad Hilton and Michigan Avenue, and of course, Grant Park. And what I saw was the, the, the beatings and the clubbings and the roughhousing that eventually, you know, gave Chicago a very black eye in the, in the eyes of the world. I saw uh, they went for the ringleaders, and they got to a lot of the ringleaders, but in doing so, they were indiscriminate in their beating and, and clubbing and knocking around anybody that would get in their path as they went for the ringleaders. And this was, this was a rather, you know, rather obviously startling, incredible thing to see, and that's why I said that I had never experienced anything like this before, and I hoped I never would again see this going on in a great American city. The, um, um, the, the, the police generally were uh, out of hand in trying to do what they felt they had to do. Uh, you know, I was staying in the Sherman House, yet I had to write my stories. The Post Dispatch leased space in the bottom of the Conrad Hilton Hotel. And so I had to get, when I would come back from the amphitheater, I would have to make my way in the basement of the Conrad Hilton Hotel to, to write my stories for publication the next morning in the Post Dispatch. And then after that was over, <clears throat> usually at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I would have to make my way from the Conrad Hilton back to where I was staying, as I said, at the Sherman House Hotel. And that was, I guess, a three or four block walk. Would that be right? A little more than that. A little more. Maybe a little more than that. And action was going on all over the streets and alleyways. <laughs> and I was lucky I didn't, get, I didn't get hurt or hit. I was watching police chasing protesters down the middle of the streets. I was watching fisticuffs and billy clubs being swung in alleys. I was watching um, um, just about things that you never, as I said, you never thought you would see in an American city going on. It was just, and this is at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, I wore a suit. Uh, reporters still wore, suit, wore suits then, at least I did. And so that made me suspect to the protesters. They naturally thought I was a um, plainclothes policeman or some, some part of the establishment, obviously. So I would, I would be taunted a lot, you know, and so on, but I, I, I wasn't injured. Uh, I, had break, I had breakfast every Tuesday morning with a bunch of my close buddies, and we were talking about this, and they said, well, hey, why don't you, you just take off your tie and your suit coat? Well, if I'd done that, then the cops would have thought I was a protester. <laughs> so, so Taylor? What was I? What was I going to do? Now, anyway, 
when I get a chance for one more shot here tonight, I'm going to tell you <laughs> it was a challenge getting through the lobby of the Conrad Hilton, which was jammed with protesters uh, every night to get down to that basement to write my story. And I had a very interesting experience on the third night, Wednesday night, in trying to make my way through the lobby, which I hope I get to <laughs> elaborate. <laughs> Well, I wanted to question there. Yeah, I wanted to open it up for some questions, and based on the comments you just made, I think I want to start with you, Alderman. And you're in the convention. I'm going to start with a question. Yeah, this was that, Taylor. Yeah, and we've got a photograph to prove it. I, I want to start with a <laughs> question about what went on in the convention, then I'll get to the comments about the police. So the question about what went on in the convention: Can you share your story about one young reporter named Dan Rather? Um, Dan Rather uh, came uh, as a, um, a TV reporter to the convention hall and he had a confrontation, confrontation with Commander Paul McLaughlin. Uh, he pushed uh, Commander McLaughlin, which is not a good idea to push a Chicago <laughs> police commander, and uh, Commander McLaughlin uh, took him into custody. Yeah, I heard a comment here. I mean, the, this is where oral historians and historians in general encounter problems because, golly, Dan Rather had a slightly different interpretation. And of later in his career, he admitted that he told uh, an untruth about that confrontation. Uh, but the truth is uh, that on that uh, night that Taylor referred to um, at uh, Grant Park, 150 five Chicago cops were injured. Correct. And during the entire uh, three days of the convention, 195 Chicago cops were injured. Um, 75 Chicago police vehicles were damaged in the confrontation. So this was not a one-sided story. There are two sides to every story. And then in the middle, there's the truth. The uh, end result, and everybody can start weighing in on these comments, but the end result of all this is, Taylor, you know very well, a uh, guy by the name of Dan Walker, who will be future governor of Illinois, writes what becomes known as the Walker Reports, called it a police riot. Mm -hmm. So I'll but, start with you, and then I'll let other ways way go. I'd like to say something about okay. it, if I may. Do you want to? Yeah. Do that for, uh, about the police. The police were certainly, in, first of all, the Chicago, city of Chicago had probably one of the finest police departments in the United States. We, have had, we had Woodrow, uh, or Orlando Wilson, uh, completely revised that, that police department. The training procedures, they were good. He completely revised the type of personnel that the police department had. They were young men, they were family men, it was an excellent police department. They went through a period in April when the West Side riots took, took place. They burned 20 blocks, if you can imagine that. They killed, people lost their lives. And the police were criticized for not doing enough. In fact, a former friend of mine, Senator Charles Chu, said daily, let's, let's, let's get on the stick. And so the mayor suffered public relations wise for, because of what the police said they weren't tough enough now wait let me just finish and you can see which, uh, that wasn't going to happen here and and that's and if you realize that these people these police that you're describing on on Wednesday night basically uh, had gone through five days already of, of confrontation with these characters and they were gonna what, what do you do just let them take over the city don't beat them up just do, don't you know let them let them, they were, in fact, they, they were charging the police. So, so I think it's, I'm not, I'm not saying that every police officer behaved with, with restraint, yeah. but, I'm not, but I'm also saying that they were goaded into this, and they had all, these, this, all this history preying on them, preying on them, and so they, re, they retaliated. And as I said before, when the commander said, clear them out of this park, it's, it's 11 o'clock, they're going. That's what happened. It's, I just want to... Yeah, let me say right away, I saw a lot of police on the ground. Protesters won some of the individual battles. They took away the billy sticks or the nightclubs and they were pounding the police. I will say, when a cop was down, 
uh, pretty quickly, two or three other policemen would come to his rescue. But as Ed said, and accurately so, a lot of police were hurt, as well as, of course, hundreds and hundreds of protesters. Now, earlier, uh, Bernie brought up the Walker Report, and I do want to make a point here tonight that uh, Walker, who went on to become governor, Dan Walker, uh, as some of you here in the audience know, I'm his biographer. I spent a lot of time with Walker in the last five, six, seven years of his life. Uh, he, confided in me, he confided in me on a lot of things. We talked about his relationship with Daly. He always regretted, he regretted in the end not making up with Daly. Daly always wanted, when Walker was governor, to bury the hatchet, and he promised Walker he'd help him progress politically to maybe what the Senate or maybe even the White House. Walker wouldn't let that happen. Walker would not let that happen. Later on, he regretted it. On the Walker report in his last years, Walker told me that he regretted a little bit. He thought the Walker report was a little one-sided in favor of the protesters and against the police. If you look at the report, there's very minimal coverage given or wordage given to the atrocities, and that's what they were, the atrocities and the taunts of the protesters. Almost everything in the report uh, documents the comeback, the reaction of, of police. And on that, on that ground, Walker said, who said in the end uh, he was a big supporter of law enforcement in the United States, and he, sell, and he felt that the report actually short-circuited the uh, role of, of police in trying to preserve order and so on, and was weighed too heavily uh, in favor of the uh, of the protesters, and he regretted that in one sentence, in the middle of that report, he did use the language, or he authorized the use of the language, that what happened was a police riot. But that's the phrase that everybody remembers today. Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to you here, Alderman, you're in the convention center, but many of your friends are out there in the streets. What were you hearing from them? What were they telling you? Well. You know, I've been asked this question quite a bit. Uh, let's go back to 1968, 50 years ago, and talk about what policing uh, represented. Uh, today, we're used to seeing uh, police officers walk around with a two-way radio uh, on their um, lapel or on their shirt. We didn't have radios if we were outside the squad car 50 years ago. You had no communications. For many days leading up to the beginning of the convention, almost 50 years ago this month, all days offs were canceled. All the cops were on 12-hour shifts. There was uh, uh, rumors uh, floating around uh, while cops were stuck in these big paddy wagons, sweltering in the heat with no con air conditioning and no communication, the supervisors could not control them as they could today. This simply would not happen today. But we can't judge um, by today's standards what happened 50 years ago. Did some cops uh, get out of control? The answer is yes. Uh, by and large, I agree with what Bernie said. We had the best police department in the nation. Uh, Richard J. Daly brought in Orlando Wilson in 1960, a professor from California who totally changed um, the uh, Chicago Police Department. Um, and the Eastern uh, liberal uh, press, including the Cronkites and the Wallaces and the, and the Rather, Rathers, got away with a lot of... Uh, skewering of the facts of 1968, in my opinion. But the issues were beyond whether one particular policeman or one particular protester did something wrong or add them up on either side. We were in a struggle over the future of democracy. What was our city, what was our state, what was our nation going to look like? Which kind of president were we going to elect? Were we going to continue the war in Vietnam? Were we going to continue racial discrimination in its worst form, so Chicago was only slightly better than being in the South? Were we going to continue the imperial presidency when the president could get away with the kinds of things Nixon got away with until Watergate? 
this was more than just some individuals acting out. This was part of a clash, a clash which was really a fight over the future of the country. And each person who was involved, whether they were in the convention hall, they were in the streets, whether they were police or protesters or delegates, thought that whatever happened, the future of the country depended on them and their friends, and they were very angry at the other side. There were very few people in the middle on this question. You know, they were on one side or the other side. Their friends, their information was all one-sided. And it was an important clarifying clash out of which our history is made. I wanted to, to come back to you, and this might be an unfair question, but I suspect you know all about this. The impact in the Democratic Party and what happened in 1972 in terms of the selection of delegates. Yes. So, first of all, I uh, forget who made the comment. Uh, one of the reasons um, Nixon was elected in 68 is a number of the people who were part of the McCarthy, Kennedy, McGovern forces or part of the protests um, didn't vote for Humphrey. And Humphrey lost, not because there weren't other people who were on Humphrey's side on, an individual, on individual issues, they were, but they wouldn't vote for Humphrey. They were that mad. And so the first thing that happened was that uh, the uh, White House was given to Nixon and then everything followed that relates to, to the 68, 72. The change in 72, my colleague Bill Sanger and Jesse Jackson led Chicagoans in an alternative convention method. Uh, McGovern was able to change the rules within the Democratic Party because of the experience of 68, the unfair selection of delegates. I won't get into all the technical things about that, but there was a sense that there were too many, that, that the smoke-filled rooms were still working and it wasn't really a democracy, and so there were new rules. We would elect all of the delegates, mostly, in the primaries, and there would be open rules about how those elections would have to be conducted, and Chicago under Daley decided not to, do, to follow those rules. Bill Singer and Jesse Jackson all, uh, created alternative meetings in rooms like this, and we elected alternative delegates. And you get down to the convention, and the alternative delegates and the daily delegates were each given 50% of the seats. The daily delegates walk out, and the alternative delegates get it. McGovern gets the nomination, and things go on from there. So yes, you're quite right. 68 led to when internal reforms in the elections in the parties, particularly the Democratic Party. That led to McGovern's uh, nomination, and that led to defeat again in 72. And Watergate and the rest follows mm -hmm. from that. The next question. And I was one of the ones thrown out in 72. <laughs> right. And it is Columbia University historian Douglas Brinkley who noted the Democratic vote had dropped from 61% for LBJ in 1964 to 42.7% for Humphrey. So, in a certain sense, they got what they asked for. And I don't recall myself, do you know how many of those votes went to George Wallace? Because there was that third party candidate in 68. That, that's because another 18 uh, element of the, that you can't ignore. 18% of 18 the vote. 18%. Appro I may be off by a couple, of, basically 18% of the vote. A question that ne either one of you could feel, but I'm going to throw it your direction first, Taylor. <laughs> Senator Ribicoff's comments. His comments, he's standing on the podium, the Daily delegate, excuse me, the Illinois delegation is right in front of the podium, and this is after everything is happening on the outside. The delegates are seeing this on TV inside the convention center. Ribikoff stands up and makes this comment in the process of nominating George McGovern. And if George McGovern were president, we wouldn't have Gestapo tactics in the streets of Chicago. And you were right there. I was there. Reporters were allowed in the amphitheater to go out at 10 minutes at a time on the, on the floor to whatever delegation they were covering. That was part of my 10 minutes out there with the Illinois delegation on Wednesday night when Rivikoff was on the podium uh, shouting down, looking right at Daly and saying that his police were using his stop tactics and all that. Now, I had been gone out there to interview uh, Francis Lorenz, a name that some of you may remember. 
he was a um, member of the, uh, of the Democratic delegation, and he was close to Daley, and he was, he was sitting right in front of Daley. So when I was talking to Lorenz, I was kneeling down behind his chair, and then Daley was sitting right behind me. And uh, I finished with Lorenz, and then I went around, and I, I, I tried to see somebody, and I can't remember who that I knew that was in the row behind Daley. And I, I, I kneeled down, and that's when Rivikoff really took off. And Daly responded by yelling, shut up, get off the podium. And then Rivikoff kept shaking his finger at Daly. And then Daly put his hands, cuffed his hands around his mouth and yelled, boo, started saying boo, boo, boo. And immediately all the Chicago Democrats in the delegation started booing. It was just like in unison. And I was out there for that. And I didn't get to see, but that had to be the time when Daly uh, executed the famous uh, hand across the throat <laughs> maneuver. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of it. And uh, it, was, it was just my luck that that was one time I was out there on the floor uh, trying to uh, catch up on a couple things with some of the delegates that would talk to me. And uh, it's interesting in looking back because so much attention was paid to that as a pivotal uh, as a pivotal uh, uh, event in, in the convention. Obviously, I knew, and I was delighted that I knew I had the headline story, obviously, <laughs> in, the, in the morning edition of the Post-Dispatch. Now, Taylor, as you start this story, the alderman takes a picture out of his packet here because you're in that picture. So I what, thought you were going to blow that one up and show the audience, but uh, I was... Well, they saw it when they were coming in. Did but, they? Yeah. I was uh, in a bookstore uh, a few months ago, and I saw this book playing with fire about the 1968 election, and I happened to be paging through, and there's this historic uh, photo, uh, Taylor, of uh, Daly, and Daly did not say what the reporters said he said. He was a witness. I was a witness. Did not happen. I want to echo that statement. Daly was accused. It's been written a number of times since that convention that Daly said some uh, very derogatory things, and I did not hear the mayor say those things, and I could hear everything he was saying. I've been kind of neglecting you, Bernie. Uh, this is a question that all can weigh in, but I'm going to start with you. And the question is one that I've gotten a few times when I'm doing some radio shows about this. What's the short-term impact of 68, and what's the long-term impact of the Democratic Convention and all the goings-on in 68? Well, the short-term, uh, obviously, is, was, a, was the election of Richard Nixon. Uh, I think the long-term uh, was that we saw a Democratic... By the way, when this, Democrat, when this convention took place, I think it was 16 or 13, only 16 or 13 states had primaries. The rest didn't have any primaries. They were just, it was a, the delegates would be selected. They didn't. Uh, so the, the, the long term is that the, uh, the, uh, the process, the democratic process for the Democratic Party has changed a great deal. And I think that, that had a great deal. Um, one of the things, by the way, you didn't mention about 68, Ed, was that it was also the year that the miniskirt came. <laughs> I always, for some reason, I always I'm remember. I'm sorry, I'll have to uh, add that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but actually, what, and I say that only because uh, it's uh, an entree to that, in fact, communication of political parties changed drastically with, with 1968. We began to look at the news, and uh, televisions were more popular, and so it was, it was a, uh, if, if you could look ahead 50 years and see what we've got now, uh, those, those were some of the changes that, that were taking place. I don't think, uh, now, is culturally what happened, big question, because what happened after that? Um, I think that there was, enough, uh, there was enough of a backlash, especially with the Richard, short term, with, with Richard Nixon and law and order. And so even though you've got these powerful images, that seem to dominate towards the end, and it's all the police doing bad yeah. things. 
the public took the, a different de attitude? Definitely. In fact, Mayor Daley, uh, his, 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 the citizens of Chicago, his, his, uh, his stead went up a great deal. Uh, people, now, well, now, but there, that's there, not entirely true. No. Uh, so let me just correct a little okay, bit Okay, go that. ahead. So yes, if you took a public opinion poll, people supported Daley. Yes. But in truth, um, his, so first of all, Daley became more dictatorial after 68. Um, we can go into that, but, uh, but he also, for the first time, was criticized in the media. And so all of the media had been essentially lapdogs for Daley. They were all saying, well, great, Mayor Daley, you opened it, you cut another ribbon, you've opened a highway, you know, that kind of story. Afterwards, there were critical uh, stories and editorials in the newspapers and on television about local politics, not just talking about 68 itself and the criticisms about the convention. And that changed the whole dynamic. And Daly, in fact, uh, began to uh, lose some of his push. Now, he won the next several elections. He won uh, the 71 election. He won the 67. He won the uh, before. He won the 71. He won the 75. But blacks were voting with their feet. They had essentially stopped voting for Daley in large numbers, and that became the base for Harold Washington later, among other things. Daley was weakened to the point, and I may be slightly off on this, someone need to catch me, but uh, essentially he didn't uh, keep the majority. He won the election in 75, uh, but his, his numbers began to drop, and more importantly, the numbers of actual people voting for him dropped dramatically. So there was a beginning uh, that then led to Jane Byrne and all sorts of other things that, uh, that happened afterwards. Uh, but Richard J. Daley still was dominant but was weakened uh, by 68 in terms of his uh, support in, in the media and his support in elections. Would you say that the machine that he had developed that had been developed over many decades was weakened? It did begin to weaken as Daly went along. There was a, a series of lawsuits, the Shackman lawsuits. We get into a long story. Of, there was more than 68 going on by the 70s. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, mm -hmm. Daly began to be weakened, and the whole history of Chicago began to pivot. How much of that has to do with 68, you know, is a whole different issue. Yeah. Um, ask, ask, you give both of you an opportunity to weigh in on that long-term impact question, and then we've got to get to the audience, because they've been impatiently waiting to ask their questions. Long-term impact, uh, there'll never be another presidential nominating convention in Chicago. Uh, Chicago uh, has hosted more presidential nominating conventions than any other place in the nation. Uh, there is nothing in the Constitution or the laws of the nation that provide for a presidential nominating uh, convention. It has become irrelevant. Uh, by the time the conventions take place, uh, the decision is already made. Uh, and perhaps one of these distinguished authors might uh, uh, decide to uh, uh, write a book about whether or not American politics was uh, producing better candidates when it was done by party leaders than when it was turned over to. Uh, <laughs> there you go. The others. I don't, they are. And I might add in this audience here in Springfield, the land of Lincoln, if it wasn't for politicians in Chicago in 1860 rigging the convention that nominated Abraham Lincoln, he never would have been president of the United States. <laughs> Taylor. I, I don't have anything to add to what Ed just said. I, I, I agree with Ed, uh, his analysis. The, that was one of the last conventions where there was real suspense involved and uncertainty involved going into it. Now they're all cut and dry. They're just theater. And as, as we all know, uh, everything's decided ahead of time uh, before the conventions. And uh, they're not as much fun to cover. Uh, I don't think a lot of newspapers don't even send teams of reporters anymore to cover conventions because it's all, it's just, uh, it's, it's a waste of resources because there's no doubt about the outcome. So I think that's been one of the, one of the, I think the last convention, and I, and I covered it, where there was some suspense, was in 76 in Kansas City, the Republican convention, when Ford uh, was, was in office and Reagan was mounting a serious challenge. And going into that convention, 
there was really some some feeling that that, that Reagan, who was lobbying who was lobbying like crazy, he had a strong contingent there. That Reagan might upset Ford, really upset Ford, in the voting at the convention. It didn't happen, but there was a lot of suspense connected with it. And I think, politically speaking, in terms of conventions, that was probably the last convention where everything was not totally cut and dry before the delegates arrived in the convention city. Okay, now. The opportunity here, if we can turn the lights up just a little bit here for the audience. I'm sure some of you have questions. Um, hopefully I'll be able to find you in the, in the crowd here and uh, call on you. And please, please, please wait until there's a microphone in your hand to start asking the question. Mark, we're over here uh, to your left. Okay. To put my question in perspective, the 68 Democratic Convention occurred uh, during the summer between my sophomore and junior years in college. And I don't remember where the Republican Convention was held. I don't remember whether it was held before or after the Democratic Convention. Miami. Okay. Before. And the oh, question I after. have is... First week, after. First the Republican week. Convention was in Miami and uh, you might be interested to know that nobody was killed in Chicago in 68 but three people were killed in Miami during the uh, Republican convention. But nobody remembers the chaos of the Republican convention in 68 like the Democratic convention. Why is that? They didn't have a good stage manager. <laughs> <laughs> is that, uh, anybody else want to weigh in on the question? Why do we remember the Democrats in 68 and not the Republicans. Well, there was no suspense. I mean, everybody yeah. knew what was going to happen at the Republican yeah. convention. They could have skipped it. <laughs> okay. R right up in the uh, second row here. But where the... Well, passing the mic uh, then. Oh, you're, you're you cutting her off. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. We'll get down. We'll get Just down. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. This will be quick. Go the, ahead. The protesters try to break into the convention hall in 68? No, they never got out that far. Uh, and it was staged. They Remember this. Um, TV cameras today are ubiquitous. But at that time, they were big, lumbering uh, devices, and they were not uh, mobile. So um, it, it might be uh, argued that the uh, protest at the, Senator, at the uh, General Logan uh, statue across from the uh, Conrad Hilton Hotel where 10,000 gathered that night was um, in a certain sense uh, a kind of a theatrical staging uh, of uh, something that could be easily transmitted to uh, viewers across the nation. And, and, and the one walk, with it, the one march that we did do, we were turned back a mile uh, from the amphitheater. And, and the, uh, the other march that was permitted was the, um, the mules. Yeah, uh, yeah. Martin Luther uh, King. Uh, Abernathy yeah. right. uh, uh, was leading that one. And the, uh, the um, amphitheater was surrounded in barbed wire. It was, and it was one entrance into it. So. And remember, the amphitheater was out, located out in the uh, Chicago Stockyards area, yeah. far from the downtown right. hotels, right. far from the downtown parks, far from the uh, lakefront. Now, the protesters negotiated for four or five months before that to march to the amphitheater, and they wanted to be heard, and there was no way. There was no, you don't have to be a lobbyist for 40 years to tell. You're not going to. You mean the, the mayor wasn't going to permit that? <laughs> oh gosh! Yeah, there was no permit. And he was a he was a master of malapropisms. And one of those uh, statements oh, yeah. he made, uh, Dick, you'll remember, was that the the police are there. They're not there to create the disorder. They're there to preserve the disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and then his press secretary said to the press. Don't print what he says, print what he means. <laughs> oh, that's good. Maybe, uh, maybe the press secretary, Earl Bush, could be of use to Trump. <laughs> okay. Next. Yes, up front here, if we can get the microphone there. Okay, well, one disclaimer, I obviously was born way after this even happened, so um, I don't remember, obviously, any of this. Um, so this has been completely fascinating for me, but um, 
the impact that the convention had on the society at the time, do you see anything happening like that in today's society? Or what, you know, what kind of an event would have to happen? And, um, or have we just become, I guess, the phrase I've heard lately is outrage fatigue. Have we just had so many, you know, protests and events and marches and stuff that, you know, if something like this were to happen today, it would just be another blip on CNN and we would go on to the next I event think, the next day. I think there have been several. Of the best uh, example I can give you is the Women's March on the day after Trump's inauguration. <laughs> and cities all over the country. In Chicago, I think there were 250,000 people. I was there, but I didn't count everyone at the time. <laughs> but something in that ballpark, it was not even a march because they couldn't march. It was such a big crowd. They just simply gathered in the Michigan Ave, same area as where the 68 event occurred. And I think that had a, a, a lot of spillover effects. I think a lot of people took up a lot of those questions and issues. So no, I don't think that um, all protests, I mean, we may have protests that don't work, and we may have protests that uh, aren't meaningful, and they may be nonviolent and not have the clashes with the police as much most of the time. But um, uh, the other would be Black Lives Matter. Uh, those series of protests, I'm not arguing about you know, who's right and wrong on it, but is there a clash that happens in public that has the same profound cultural effect? Yes, I think there are today. And if I may just say, the, uh, and I, that's something that I'm think, I think a lot about. And, and uh, uh, one of the things that it seems today is if you went with the protests, the large protests have an objective and they have an ideology and they, have, they want to create a certain situation or correct a certain situation. What you had in 68 was, was certainly those, those types of protests, the anti-Vietnam, the racial protests, the racial discrimination protests, very valid. But you also had something that I don't see today, and that's this subculture, they call it the counterculture, uh, of, uh, of people who just don't, just want to drop out, man just want to make love in the weeds and smoke my weed and free money and free food and man, we don't want to work ever. Now there were thousands of these young people and it really, uh, that, the yippies are the, probably the best example of that. Uh, uh, these people were sending permit applications, if I may, this is from my public administration classes. They would send this crazy permit application to the city of Chicago, the park districts, and they would wrap it, they wrap their permit application in a Playboy centerfold. <laughs> and the language of that permit application, and if you, now just imagine if you're the commissioner of parks and you, you just, uh, and free have, food, free food, free, free love, sex, free, free sex, sex, free yeah, hue, and, and, and every, free marijuana. Every four letter word that you can possibly think of was in those things. Those type of people today are not, <laughs> thank you, Lord, are not very popular and don't attract thousands and thousands of followers. But they did in 68, and it's in, what always is still interesting to me, maybe it's the third book, um, why? I mean, what happened to this gifted generation? And, and, and we, all of us up on the stage are part of a, that gifted generation. Not that we're smarter than people, but we were given the opportunity to, to succeed. And uh, that's, I'm, a little, I'm preaching a little bit, but so I see the protests today, they, they have objectives. What you don't see today, 50 years ago you did, was this crazy subculture stuff that I still haven't figured out why it started. Next one in the back here. Sorry if you stand up, the one with Mike, yeah. Me? Yes. Okay. I'm curious what effect you think that Mayor Daley's shoot to kill order doing the uh, Martin Luther King riots, one of the few mayors to, to tell his police to do that. Did that make the police feel they had more of a green light? If I, if I can I'll lead it off and I ask Dick to, to comment. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor Daley received some real criticism for what was going on. And he made that shoot or to kill arsonists and to maim looters. Uh, the police will give a couple. Listen to that. And, uh, and, 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 and with that statement, let me say this, and I said it a little bit in my opening remarks. He had backing of 
many black leaders. One of them uh, is, uh, is Charles Jew, state senator. I happen to know Charlie very well, or knew him very well. And uh, he said, you know, we've got to have law and order here. And, and, and so, yes, yes. Alderman, you want to have a comment on that? Uh, I haven't seen the results, but I know that uh, there was a protest movement in uh, Chicago today that was going to close down uh, Lakeshore Drive and disrupt mm. uh, people's lives. But I think it's, it's fair to say that political leaders and police tactics have changed dramatically over the um, last several years. Today, protesters get away with a great deal more than they could have 10 years ago. Uh, and as a result, I think society itself is more open-minded about people marching and, and protesting and, and whatever. Um, and I think you can see it in our daily lives. I think, if I may just add one thing to what the alderman said. Uh, I was teaching a night class about two years ago in Chicago. And when I go up and teach, I, I stay at a place called the Allegra Hotel. It's the old Bismarck Hotel. It's a half a block from City Hall. And my class got over at 8 o'clock, and I heard about this protest at City Hall. And it was, and they were walking down the street, and it was, you know, kind of all the news was covering it. And I, you know, I had to go see. I had to go see. So I went the half a block and went down there, and I was amazed at the tactics of the police as opposed to 1968. They were walking with the protesters. They were joking with the protesters. They were talking. It was an entirely non-confrontational situation. Very, very good. It worked, it worked that, at least that time. We've already gone past the time I was talking about, but we'll take a couple more questions than this gentleman right here. Uh, hi, my name is Douglas Holt. Uh, I've had the privilege of playing Bob Moses in all the way in a local production here. So when one of you had mentioned about I think it was your turn, uh, about the middle ground, in other words, that, that we were on one side or the other, with today having the many different groups of people, as in you met, just, just mentioned about the evolving minds of people, how is it from where we were 1968 to where we are now, having some dealing with some of the same issues, what do you, how, how do you see us trying to resolve those issues so that we don't end up in the same place 50 years from now? Um, one of the pieces of advice Mayor Daly gave me was, um, "Hey kids, you ain't got the votes." Um, <laughs> I think we need to have the votes. Um, you know, so I'm a great proponent of being involved in the 2018 election, the 2019 election in Chicago, the 2020 election for president. And I, my own view is we've got to win the vote. Uh, otherwise, we get caught in these clashes with some pretty terrible results. So there are other things you can do, the protests, you can organize interest groups, you can, uh, you know, do consciousness raising. There are lots of things you can do, but in the immediate future to keep us from having uh, some of the bad results uh, out of this previous period and still having the same problems like discrimination, uh, I think we've got to get the votes and we've got to not only change the laws but change the culture. We have to get people agreeing with our solution and then enact the solution and see that it works. And then everybody will say, hey, that's a pretty good idea. Why, why were they doing that back in the way they were in the Civil War, the 68 Convention, or in our era, if we don't fix things? Anybody on this side want to address that one? We've got time then for one more question. You uh, I've made some enemies up front now. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you, you addressed uh, briefly in the opening remarks the, the specter of uh, resurrection of Lyndon Johnson. Um, I, I had heard lots of stories about Johnson sitting in the White House believing that uh, there would be a gridlock, a deadlock, and he would be, uh, he would be summoned to come. Did, did you run into any of this in the convention? Was there much talk about Johnson in, in that uh, in that? The vein. Some authors and historians have posed that um, theory, and 
uh, early on when um, um, Lyndon Johnson set the date of the convention, he uh, set it uh, to coincide with his birthday. But uh, I think uh, his hope that they might have drafted him uh, went out the window when the uh, Russian tanks rolled into um, Prague. Prague. Uh, Prague, and, and then it, it was all over. Yeah, and you have to remember, these are elected delegates, um, the ones pledged to McCarthy and the ones after Kennedy pledged to McGovern were never going to vote for Johnson, and some of the people who were the Humphrey supporters weren't going to go for, for Johnson. There, weren't, there wasn't the numbers, uh, even if Johnson had wanted to, to come in. Um, you know, and, and can you imagine what would have happened with Lyndon Johnson coming in, so, you know, saying, I don't like what's going on? Um, you know, it just, it wouldn't have played. It wouldn't have worked. Uh, there are times of moments. Inside or outside. Inside or outside. Well, outside, there was no support, I mean, in terms of the streets. I thought it was interesting that in the amphitheater and in all the, in all the political stories, Lyndon Johnson's name, although he was president of the United States, was hardly mentioned. Right. He just wasn't a factor among those covering the convention or those trying to understand what was happening. And I just thought that was, that was interesting. I did want to add one thing before we disband, because I came out of journalism, and there are a number of journalists hurt in covering the 68 convention, uh, especially TV cameramen. And I did want to, I did want to point that out before we uh, disband tonight. I, I was lucky. I wasn't hurt, but a number of my compatriots were. Let's finish by thanking our four panel members. Thank you for watching the Illinois Channel. You may also wish to follow us online, where you are free to make comments or program suggestions. Get our breaking news updates on Twitter, where you can find us at Illinois Channel. You can find our past programming on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Illinois Channel TV. Or you can go to the Illinois Channel website at illinoischannel.org. There you can find not only our current video stories and programs, but also our library of past programs, as well as articles that provide additional information about Illinois issues and individuals. The Illinois Channel, keeping you connected to your state, your issues, your home.